Hello, I'm Father Mitch Packle, and welcome to EWTN Live, where we bring you guests from around the world. Our guest tonight is coming from a good distance, and he is here to help us understand how through the sacred scriptures, God reveals to us the importance of love in our relationship to him and how we can demonstrate authentic love in our own lives, regardless of our vocation. Before we speak to him, though, we want to talk briefly with EWTN's John Elson about some upcoming special programs. John, what have you got for us? Well, it's good to be with you, Father. I want Thank to let you. you and our audience know of some exciting uh, programs debuting in the near future. Uh, tomorrow, August 18th, at 10.30 a.m. Eastern, we'll be presenting an original film entitled Let Your Heart Not Be Troubled. Uh, this is an echoing of our Lord's words uh, recorded in uh, St. John's Gospel. Mm -hmm. And it tells the uh, fictional but all too real story of a parent, in this case a father, who had fallen away from the faith, feeling as if he is losing his uh, now grown daughter, both emotionally and spiritually. So it's something they, where he was struggling with, he sees a, a pilgrim uh, and uh, who teaches him the power of fervent prayer and gives him other counsel, which I think our audience will find very meaningful. Uh, this upcoming Saturday, uh, August 20th at 8 p.m. Eastern, we'll be presenting another special entitled A Place at the Table, African Americans on the Path to Sainthood. We'll be presenting the stories of Pierre Toussaint, Henriette de Lille, Father Augustus Tolton, mm -hmm. and many others whose examples are, are incredible. Uh, not only for their faith witness, but for the obstacles they had to overcome in, in being the, uh, yeah. the, the incredible uh, apostles and missionaries that they were. Next week on Friday, August 26th at 5.30 p.m. Eastern, we'll be presenting a separate special entitled I Forgive with Immaculate Illibagiza. Our audience may know Immaculate's story, sure. having survived miraculously the Rwandan genocide in 1994. And in this special, which was filmed on location in Rwanda, she tells her own journey through her Catholic faith to forgiveness. We know the, the incredible importance that forgiveness has in our own salvation, that we pray in our, our Father, that our Lord uh, exhorts us to forgive 70 times, seven times. And she, through her faith, as I mentioned, was able to choose to forgive the man who murdered her family and, and a number of other relatives. Yeah. So we're very excited to bring that story. We'll also be developing a separate project with Immaculate dedicated to sharing the testimonies of different individuals who, again, through their Catholic faith, have chosen uh, forgiveness. So we're very excited about that. And finally, next week, Saturday, August 27th at 2 p.m. Eastern, we'll be presenting a very interesting story about the Pope's, entitled The Pope's Photographer, Arturo Mari. Mm -hmm. Arturo Mari was a, uh, the official papal photographer for decades and he shares his intimate and very personal reflections about the pontificate and the, and the, the popes through Pope uh, Pius XII all the way through Pope John Paul II. So it's kind of an inside, very tender look at a man who saw these, uh, these great leaders of the faith, not only through the camera, but in, 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 in person, face to face, in his own uh, private life as well. So it's a yeah. beautiful story. And finally, I want to let our audience uh, see some uh, behind the scenes in production images of a new docudrama that we're, we're just, just finished filming entitled Pier Giorgio Frassati to the Top. This is an original docudrama and companion film that we've just finished filming in Italy. So we're very excited to bring Blessed Pier Giorgio's uh, story to our audience. And he's an example for young and old alike. Yes. Uh, we're going to bring out his Eucharistic dimensions of his spirituality, his strong Marian uh, devotion. And this will be recounted by his uh, li last living niece, Wanda Garanska, and also Christine Wohar of Frasati USA and a number of other experts. So we're very excited and grateful to our audience for the ability to bring these programs uh, to our audience. And we, we're so grateful for their continued support and prayers. Great. Well, thank you for the update. We appreciate it very much. And we'll be back just in a couple of minutes with tonight's guest. So please stay with us.
Welcome back. Our guest is a professor of moral theology at the Pontifical University of St. Thomas Aquinas in Rome. And since 2005, he's been the theologian of the papal household. He's also the author of the book, The Mystery of Divine Love. He is joining us from our EWTN studios in Rome, just down the street from the Vatican. So please welcome Father Wojciech Gertich of the Order of Preachers, a Dominican priest. Poch on the bon Jesus Christus. Na wieki wieku wamen. For those who aren't Polish, this is the standard greeting that one gives a priest when you, when you meet them in Polish. And it's, praise be Jesus Christ forever and ever. Yes. Father, it is great to have you back yes. with us. Yes. And I, I just, we, you wrote this book, The Mystery of Divine Love. And the first thing that has struck me in reading it is that you spend a great deal of time giving us absolutely wonderful insights also into faith and then hope and then finally get to love, charity. Um, how is it that you named it after love but you have so much on faith and hope as well. Well, first of all, in response, uh, I have to say that really I haven't written the book. I spoke it ah. because the book is the recording of a retreat that I gave to a group of ladies outside New York a few years back. Mm -hmm. And my retreat was recorded and they asked me to have it published. So, um, but as to the question, the point that you bring up, I think the, um, when we discuss the theological virtues, it is a bit like in the study of anatomy. You can study particular limbs of a person, but the body is a composite whole. The person, if he's alive, the entire body is functioning. Mm -hmm. So our relationship to God entails all the three theological virtues. And as we reflect upon them, we can distinguish them, we can name them, we can locate them in the human psyche, we can speak about their growth, about their origin, and so on. But in practical life, as we relate to God, they function together. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, God is love, as St. John tells us. God is awaiting for an encounter between God and us and to enable to encounter God, to, to, to enter into a relationship, we need all the three theological virtues. And faith is first, uh, uh, and then it's followed up in our will with, with, the, uh, with hope, which focuses us onto God. And then as a consequence, we live out love. Huh? So uh, in that retreat, I spoke about the particular theological virtues, but the ultimate end, the, the, the reason why the whole thing is important for us is that we engage with God in a relationship of love. Yeah. I'd like to begin with some of your insights on faith. Um, you, you had uh, okay. what I considered a, a really wonderful analogy. You talk, first of all, about baptism giving us this gift of faith, and you compared it to a computer program that helps you use the computer. This is something that is put into us by God at baptism. God grants us this gift of faith, but then you have to use the program later on and begin to exercise that faith. Uh, I'm shortening it, but explain a little bit about that. Well, uh, at baptism, we have, we receive all the theological virtues and the gifts of the Holy Spirit, which are located in the essence of our soul. In fact, 
it doesn't necessarily ha happen uniquely at baptism because God in his goodness does grant his gifts even before baptism, mm -hmm. outside baptism. But certainly when we are baptized, we have the certitude that we have received these supernatural tools that have been given to us by God that enable us to encounter him. That's why I like this image of the computer program, sure. which is sometimes installed in a program and completely forgotten about. Huh? And we may work on many things, do many things, and we don't know that in our computer there is this program. And sometimes there comes a moment that we have to do something new. And we are perplexed and worried, oh, I have to buy a new program to install it in the computer. And suddenly, hey, you discover it's already there. And there's a moment of joy. Yeah? I can do it. It's just a simple thing. And the program appears on the screen. And it's similar with the graces that we have received, certainly at baptism, and some people before baptism, and that leads them to baptism. These graces uh, uh, installed in our soul give us the capacity, give us the, the, the supernatural habit which enables us to encounter God, to, to transfer, to cross the great chasm between man and God, between creator, cre creation and, and the creator. And this is something that we cannot do with our own efforts. But the grace of faith, which is the first of the theological virtues, when it's exercised, it extends our mind towards the life-giving mystery. And this capacity to extend our mind, to believe in the mystery, this is something that we have received from God. It's installed in our, in our being. Now, I like this image because there are many people who say about themselves, oh, I don't believe, you know, I'm, I'm an atheist, you know, I don't, I don't engage with God. I'm not a believer. And I ask them, are you baptized? Oh, yes. Well, if you have been baptized, you have faith. Maybe you're not using it, but you have faith. Huh? Yes. And so you don't need an extraordinary, we don't know what, uh, to arrive at faith. It's in you. Huh? And sometimes in some moment of trial or difficulty, suddenly people have been baptized, suddenly they have this immediate reaction and they relate to God. No, so, one, yeah, one, uh, uh, yeah, I'd like to follow up on that because uh, in traditional theology, we talked about it as an instinct of faith that's given to us at baptism. And over the years, I've known many people that taught first and second and third grade children, and they would often describe how these small children would just drink in the faith. It, it, th there was a connaturality there was, that the faith fit what was working in their souls. They may not have understood the mysteries fully, but they responded positively when somebody spoke to them the mysteries of faith. And especially, I remember the nuns. They were filled with faith, and we responded as well to their faith in God as well as to what they taught us. And the computer program image yeah. helps us, I think, to also understand that in modern ways. You use the word instinct. I would say that at baptism, we have the infused virtue, which mm -hmm. is the capacity, uh, whereas the instinct, it's, it's the exercise of that capacity. Mm -hmm. Now, you're certainly correct uh, that when we speak to people, whether children or adults, but who have been baptized, and if before we open our mouths, we invite the Holy Spirit into the conversation, into what we're saying, uh, as an ally, huh? and then we may speak about the mystery, and children will respond immediately. Children will react immediately because the faith is already in there. And the experience of faith, and so the exercise of that, of that instinct, the, 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 the putting into practice that instinct, uh, immediately establishes a contact with the living God. Uh, 
And of course, you said, well, the children don't understand. Well, I would say we adults also don't understand. Right. We learn the formula of faith. We know the, learn the prayers in childhood. And all our life, we discover new uh, richness within the Our Father, within the Creed, within the Catechism. So it's a long, ongoing process as we sort of unravel the truths of faith. But the capacity to adhere to God and to accept these truths is a gift of God that we've received. It's installed in, in the computer of our soul. And this, the reason I, I brought up the lack of understanding, you mentioned the false uh, theory of catechetics, that a lot of people in catechetics, that, 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 which is the teaching of the catechism to, to various folks, they would yeah. say, well, children don't understand yeah. it, so don't teach them the mysteries of the two natures of Christ, the oneness and three personhood of the Trinity and so on. Just don't teach them all that. Just show them love or something. Uh, you refute that very nicely. Well, if, you, if that is the policy, then you are inviting the children to move out of the realm of faith and to remain only on the level of reason. And of course, the reason of a child is, is undeveloped, it's limited to the child's capacity. And then you're inviting the child to accept only what can be understood by reason. And then even if you tell them about the transubstantiation or, or the Trinity and tell them to understand, they may say, yes, I understand. But, but a few years later, they'll ditch the, this truth because they recognize that they don't understand it. So it's important to maintain in the children and in everybody this, the exercise of faith, which is an encounter with the mystery. And this is something that children catch very, very uh, immediately. I remember uh, kneeling by the Blessed Sacrament in a, in a church with a little uh, seven, maybe seven-year-old girl who hadn't yet been to, to, to First Holy Communion. And I pointed to the tabernacle. I said, this is the home where Jesus lives. And she responded, yes, I know. Huh? because she was raised in a family, she knew that she's preparing for the, for the First Holy Communion. And yes, I know, I accept the truth. Huh? But it's not something that she can explain or understand, and I cannot ex explain it even. Huh? No, and this is something and that... So it, I was going to say, the faith requires a certain humility. Another virtue that you bring out in your book that it requires a certain humility. I don't understand at all, but, you know, um, I accept that because the goal of faith is not my full comprehension. The goal of faith is God himself. God is the focus of yeah. our faith. Well, uh, faith basically is the humility of the intellect. Yes. The intellect that accepts that there is something greater. Uh, God is greater than the capacity of our mind. Huh? And faith is basically the overpowering of our mind by the revealed mystery, by the living God, huh? uh, who, uh, who is the ultimate focus. And we believe God because of God, because God first has touched us. Huh? And, and this is fundamental. Now, if we drop that and we focus uniquely on, on reason, then we start scanning uh, the truths of faith to make them comprehensible, to make them fit our, our own ideas, our own culture, and so on. And constantly, then, we fall out of faith. And, and, and uh, uh, we don't then perceive the importance of engaging with the living God, who is always mysterious. There's a, an analogy that struck me when I was studying philosophy back, uh, uh, I took summer program in New York City. And when I wasn't studying, I took advantage of living in the city. So I asked a man, how do I get to Manhattan from the Bronx where I was living? And his response was, why do you want to go to Manhattan? 
Everything's here in, Bro in the Bronx. You don't need to go to Manhattan. And I said, <laughs> that's the, uh, an image to me of the smallness of mind. I mean, Bronx was great, but it didn't have the Metropolitan Museum of Art or the Metropolitan Opera yeah. and a few yeah. other things. You know, it's, uh, that there is something beyond our little experience. And we have to have the humility and, to go and seek it out. And there is this temptation of holding on to our self-sufficiency and not accepting, you know, the fact that God is leading us beyond. God has a great program for us. God has a whole, uh, you know, vision ahead for us. Yeah. And sometimes we would prefer to lock ourselves in our self-sufficiency in a little world where we feel secure with our own forces, uh, mm -hmm. whereas the engaging with God is always an adventure. Yeah. But to do that, uh, the, uh, the mind has to go beyond. But this is not something impossible because our reason is reasonable. Yeah. And since our reason is reasonable, our reason is capable of understanding that there's more out there than what the reason is capable of knowing. Yeah. And children are, are certainly quicker to perceive this moment than adults who are sometimes proud in their, in their intellect. Yeah. And, you know, this is where uh, you, you mentioned sometimes the conflict between uh, science and faith or faith and reason. Whereas to be a good scientist, you have to realize that there is something beyond what I already understand and that I want to pursue understanding of other galaxies and other forces of physics oh. and chemistry. And, so. and my knowledge isn't sufficient, so I go, a humble scientist goes beyond it. But we have to do the same of with the meaning of the universe and of the one who created it, and namely God himself. Well, I think there's no fundamental conflict between science right. and faith. Right. But they, they, they function in different ways and there is a different realm. But just as in science, as you just mentioned, there is a humility of the knower knowing that there's more out there to be known, even though the knower doesn't yet know it all. Huh? Yeah. Similarly, in the realm of faith, we accept that God who has spoken to us is greater than the entire cosmos. Mm -hmm. And our engaging with God uh, and, our, and our loving God and being loved by God is a reality which is greater than the entire cosmos because yeah. God is above it. Huh? Yes. But this is made possible through the gift of faith that we receive from God. Now, this brings up the next part, namely hope, because as we've talked, yeah. faith shows that there's something beyond us, things that we don't understand, but hope also points us to a future beyond us and gives us a wider perspective on the events of life. And this is also extremely important to understand. Um, and you, one of the things I like is you mention different kinds of hope, like emotional hope uh, and, and such. Talk a little bit about this virtue of hope on the natural level and the supernatural. Well, on the natural level, we have, well, first of all, we have the emotion of hope that even animals have, you know, that a, 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 an antelope is running, running across the jungle, and then there is a stream, and one antelope jumps across it, and the other stops short because it doesn't have the courage, the hope that it will manage. So this is a basically bodily, psychic, emotional capacity that we all have. It's common with the animals. Then there is the virtue of, of human hope, which is basically the virtue of magnanimity. Mm -hmm. This is uh, the, the virtue which gives us the zip, the strength uh, to tackle arduous, difficult challenges which are in the future. Huh? 
We are planning something. We are going to college and we want to get a degree, you know. We want to get a job, you know. We want to win an election. We want, you know, things to change in the world, you know. And some people are boring and just sitting on the couch, you know, and waiting for things to happen. No, to get things done, we have to have this zip, huh? this psychic capacity to move forward. But this is a natural, a natural uh, 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 magnanimity, a natural hope that we can develop within, within ourselves by our own forces to overcome this faint, faint heartedness. Now, the theological virtue of hope is, is on a different level. It's supernatural. It's the gearing of our will towards ultimately happiness in God towards our ultimate end, that is God, our, our union with him for eternity in heaven. Huh? But this is something which has an impact on our life today. And so the theological virtue of hope gears our will to the mystery, just as faith in the mind opens us to the mystery that has been revealed by God. Mm -hmm. So hope opens up the will towards the, uh, the mysterious goodness the supreme goodness that God has ahead of us. And so it focuses our will through the daily encounters and situations and so on. That nevertheless, we go beyond the issues of this world towards the eternal God who is our end. I, I think... Now, I would add also yes. that if we have... Go if ahead. we have this theological virtue of hope, it also has an impact on our human hope, huh? that we are planning for things in this world, but under God. Huh? Mm -hmm. We are planning for, su for success, but under God. We may buy a lottery ticket, but we, are hoped, we hope to win you know, the, the, the million dollars, but under God, if God wants this for us. Huh? Yeah. And so the theological virtue qualifies our natural hope. Huh? And as yeah. the old joke says, when this guy was praying, God, help me win the lottery so I can help my family, he says, <laughs> yeah. you got to buy a ticket. You know? <laughs> that the ticket, of course, yeah. <laughs> so we need this human hope as well. You know? yes. We need to be moving. We need to have the zip in life. And some people have a psychic difficulty that they fail you know, to put themselves together you know, to go forward. But some people, as they go forward, they make an idol out of their, out of winning the lottery, you know, an idol out of what they want. Whereas theological hope allows us to see that God is greater, huh? that we accept that we're in the hands of God. In fact, th this is, th there are a couple things about hope, and because I'm very, very concerned that the modern world is often bereft of hope. They see only what is in this life, and they don't look beyond it. And a lot of people give up. We, we see a great increase of suicide right now. Uh, part of it was in response to yeah. the pandemic and to the economic uh, yeah. problems since then. Um, I don't know if that's also true in Europe, but it's certainly been true here in the United States. And it's as if they've just said, no, I give up, I quit. And it's got to be, uh, death would be better. Yeah. And that's not if you take your own life, it's not. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, but to have this theological hope, uh, First of all, you need faith. As I said, the theological virtues function together, and so faith is first. Huh? We need to uh, uh, work on our relationship with God through prayer, that we put ourselves in the hands of God. But then as a result, hope grows and allows us to hook ourselves onto God. Huh? One of the common images of the theological virtue of hope is an anchor that we can hook onto a solid rock, you know, that we are in the hands of God. Now, if people don't work on their theological virtues, they don't grow in them, when difficulties come, 
they suddenly panic and crash, you know. Yes. To, to persevere in a marriage which may have its ups and downs and, and moments of crisis, uh, you need to believe in the powers of grace of the sacrament of matrimony, and then you can hook on to Christ and go forward and then overcome the period of crisis and not immediately crash and, and, and quit from the marriage. Uh, yep. So yep. hope is, is, is fundamental, but it's, uh, faith is even more fundamental. It's a consequence of faith, uh, yep. and it leads to challenges. Well, before we get to that, we have to take a little break, but we'll come back in a yeah. couple more minutes yeah. to talk a little bit more about hope and faith and how it leads to yes. Christian charity yes. and the theological gift of charity. So please stay with us. Right. We are speaking with Father Wojciech Giertich of the Order of Preachers, a Dominican father who is working in Rome. He's teaching at the Dominican University in Rome and teaching moral theology, as well as being theologian to the papal household. And he's written a book called The Mystery of Divine Love. And I, I really have enjoyed it, uh, you know, enjoyed reading it. Uh, and I would urge you all to take a look at some of his reflections on faith and hope, but particularly, of course, as from the title, God's Love. You can get this book at EWTNRC.com, where it is item number 82750. 82750. And uh, Father Gerte, a um, couple things uh, I mentioned earlier that there is a lack of hope in our society. I think that leads not only to a lot of suicide, but also some of the nihilism, the, 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 the experience that nothing means anything, there's nothing in the future. Sometimes uh, people in political forces just become destructive. They tear down with their only hope being that they can refashion society according to their own image, but they don't have hope about what exists. And that's on the human level. Whereas God's hope that has him as a goal and has life, eternal life with God and eternal happiness with God as its goal, that is able to sustain martyrs, people who are in persecution, people who are suffering through all kinds of terrible yeah. circumstances. It sustains them through these terrible problems in a way that oftentimes the very wealthy have no hope for. And that's because God gives the greater perspective of goal than human life can give. Well, yes, this, there is a, also a social and a historical dimension to the theological virtue of hope in the sense that it leads us out towards the living God. Mm -hmm. Now, it's, uh, uh, the difficulty may be not only in dramatic situations with persecutions and wars and, 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 and great dramas, mm -hmm. but they, uh, the difficulty may appear in even a, simpler, a simple life where somebody has a project, has a, a, an idea for his life, he goes forward and things turn out differently. And, uh, and it's important to accept 
the theological virtue of hope, which basically tells us that God is in charge. And so we don't need to panic when things are not working out as we would like to. Of course, we need this human hope, uh, this magnanimity, which gives us the zip to go forward. But at the same time, we need to accept that God is writing straight on crooked lines of human lives. Uh, mm -hmm. And so we may have a certain project, may, we may want to attain something, but then things don't turn out as we had planned. But afterwards, as we see, they turn out even better. Huh? Mm -hmm. And so it's important to accept, you know, that in the face of these great challenges and wars and economic crises and COVID and whatever, that God is in charge, huh? that God is showing us a new dimension, which probably we would have never seen had not these difficulties not come. Huh? In some, so uh, uh, the theological virtue helps us to, 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 to deal with these challenges. One of the ironies of Christian hope is that while it is focused on God himself, that our, the goal of our hope is to live with God for all eternity in heaven. And sometimes secular people no. say, well, all you care about is heaven. But the irony to me is that it's people who believe that they will and hope to be with God forever who invented the concept and reality of the hospital that was a Catholic institution. Going back to St. Cyprian and St. Uh, John Chrysostom, yeah. the university which goes back to the University of Paris and eventually the Dominicans are part of that. The mental institution and all kinds of the orphanage and service to the poor and the building of beautiful churches. People who believed in heaven accomplished all of these great insights here on earth because they saw it in the view of hope for God and that motivated them to do these other tremendous great things. Well, the theological virtue of hope doesn't mean that we are just passively sitting in the waiting room yeah. uh, outside heaven. Huh? Right. Uh, hope gives us, uh, uh, the, the, uh, it transforms our human hopes and gives us the chance to use the graces of God and the love of God while we're here and to focus on today, on this moment today, and to give the most of what we can today. And that's why these institutions that you mentioned, hospitals, schools, universities, and so on, are all the product of the generosity of people who saw that their life doesn't terminate in their limited vision but they have a vision which is greater, and that's why they had the courage to do things which were beyond their initial imagination and to begin things that were then continued by their successors and expanded in an even greater way. Why? Because the hope is focused on heaven, huh? Yeah. On, on, on being with God, <laughs> but we begin living the being with God here on earth, huh? here on in earth, here in this world, you know. And this leads me to the next virtue, namely love, that having faith yeah. in God, where we believe Him and believe in Him, and we have hope for eternity, these both motivate us to cooperate with the grace of love. And you again, you bring out well that love is a grace from God. It's not my effort. It's a grace from God with which I cooperate. And God's love is first, and he transforms my love. Address a bit more about the virtue of love. Well, this is phenomenal that we can engage with God we can love God 
and then we can love ourselves and our neighbors with the divine love that has been imparted to us. Mm -hmm. God is love and God wants to give himself. There's more joy in giving than in receiving. And this is not only a moral uh, injunction to us, but this is something which tells us about God himself. God finds great joy in giving. And so God imparts us his love. And then we can love people with that divine love. This is something that we can love God and we can love them people with that divine love. This is something that the ancient philosophers like Aristotle uh, uh, never imagined, huh? that we can love God, huh? that yeah. we can enter into a relationship with God. And this has an impact uh, not only on eternity, but, but now. Huh? And as we m speak about eternity, we, we shouldn't think that things will be boring in heaven because eternity is not just a longer extension of time. Eternity means uh, an immediate hold grasping of everything. God lives in eternity, but he is the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. You know, God encompasses the wholeness of time. And so being in heaven, we will love with this divine love, which encompasses all the inhabitants of heaven and earth, all in one go. Huh? But as we live now on this earth, huh, we can live out this divine charity, which is a supernatural love, which is much greater than the affective, emotional, erotic, erotic love that we experience, that we feel, mm -hmm. because it elevates our love to a much higher level, that of the love of God. In it's important, uh, I'll never forget something that C.S. Lewis had written in commenting on that line in the first epistle of St. John chapter 4, where it says, God is love. If there is not the trinity of persons, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, then yeah. God's love would be more like a sweet, sticky, but bland tapioca pudding in the sky. It would just be something vague. <laughs> Whereas when we yeah. understand what God has revealed about himself, that he is Father, eternal Son, and eternal Holy Spirit, it's three persons in a constant uh, perichoresis, this dancing of self-gift, mm -hmm. this movement where they're giving themselves to each other, and they invite us into that gift. This is a, a very important element of the gift of God's love to us. There is another uh, erroneous uh, perception of God if we do not uh, uh, perceive the Trinity that has been revealed to us, the deist understanding of God, which was very common in the 18th century, yes. was the idea that God is the uh, initial watchmaker and that God created the world and then turned on the uh, uh, alarm clock for the end of time and <laughs> went to sleep. And so God who ignores us and doesn't care about us. Uh, so this is a, a completely false image, contrary to what we know from Revelation. Right. We know from Revelation that there is this internal dynamic between the three divine persons, and we are called to engage in this. St. Paul says in the epistle to the Ephesians that God chose us before the creation of the world. Mm -hmm. So before the creation of the cosmos and before the sin of Adam and before our own sins, God chose each one of us and predestined us to be the adopted children of God. So yeah. our ultimate end is not just being bored all eternity in heaven, but to live out this relationship with the loving God. And this is something that we can begin now. And those are the children of God who are led by the Holy Spirit, who are attentive to the suggestions of the Holy Spirit and who react creatively, generously to this movement of divine love that they, that they receive. And so charity, this divine love, is the only reality of heaven 
that we can experience while we are here on earth. Mm -hmm. As we love one another and we love God with this divine love, we already have one leg in heaven. And this is... And this changes the way we relate to people. Uh, see, that's, that's one of the key things, you know? that the love of God is not something that I say, well, like St. John wrote, if you say that you love God but don't love your brother that you can see, you're a liar. You know, that the love yeah. that God yeah. pours out upon us also means that I pour out myself to the people around me. But it is that same love that we have received from God which enables us to love others. Yes. Now, there's no, sometimes people think there is a, there is a sort of a contradiction or a rivalry here. Huh? Yes. There's no rivalry because as we love God, we love those who are the friends of God. If I have a friend, a friend with whom I studied years back, uh -huh, okay, he has now five children, five daughters and a number of grandchildren. Uh -huh. My relationship to his daughters and to his grandchildren is different from my relationship to people generally, uh, to children generally. They are special for me. Why? Because they are the children and grandchildren of my friend. Uh, so if I love God, I love also the friends of God, mm -hmm. the friends of God, those who are close to God, mm -hmm. and those also who are only potential friends of God, who may be distant from God, who are far away from God, but I want them to be members of that same community, that same fellowship of the friends of God. And so my love for God spills out onto other people and helps them, helps to bring them up towards God. Mm -hmm. And so uh, said in another way, if we love with the love of God, we want other people to be saints. And yep. this is important for parents, you know, as they're raising their children, you know, they're concerned that they go to school, they go to college, that they're successful in life. But deep down, if they really love them, huh, they want their children to be, good to, to be good people, to be saints. Why? Because they want them to participate in that same love which comes from God. And another element of that is they also need to want their spouse to be a saint and do what they can to help in the sanctification of their spouse rather than the more self-centered approach that I want to have what some Americans call a, tro a trophy wife or a trophy husband. Someone that makes me proud yeah. rather than someone whom I love for their own sake. And this is a good question that you can ask to engage couples and say to Jack, Jack, do you think that Jill has become a better woman under your influence or a worse woman? And Jill, do you think that, Jill, do you think that Jack has become a better man under your influence? <coughs> and, uh, and also, do you think that you have improved and changed under his influence? Have you improved and changed under her influence? Mm -hmm. And would you like to have a son like him? Oh, no, I wouldn't like to have a son like him. Well, there's something wrong there. Would you like to have a daughter like your engaged, like your fiance? Huh? Mm -hmm. uh, no, no, I wouldn't want my da the daughter to behave like her. Well, if that is the case, then they have to work on their relationship and on the quality of their love and learn how to love one another through God. Yeah. And this is something that people learn, of course, in the long process. It's uh, engaged couples may not catch it, but sometimes later on in married life, you know, they have to bring in God into their love. Yes. As this is one of the reasons I emphasize that the sacrament of matrimony is so important. Celebrating matrimony in church rather than in a romantic scene at the beach or in the woods, the, 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 it needs to have God as the center of your marriage and that a couple needs to love God more than they love each other. 
because if they love each other ahead of God, they will expect each other to be as good as God. And they can't do that. Mm. They need God to be the focus so that then they'll end up loving each other as fellow, citizens, fellow sinners on the way to God and help each other grow in yeah. holiness. But they need the love of God that he gives them before they just work on their own love. Our professor of, of uh, moral theology in Krakow uh, used to ask us the question, when does the celebration of the sacrament of matrimony end? Huh? When the <laughs> priest at the end of the mass says, Ita misaes, the mass is ended, go in peace. Huh? No, the celebration of the sacrament ends at death. You know, The yes. whole life is a celebration of the graces that we receive uh, from Christ. Uh -huh. Yes, yes, this is... And, uh, and this is to be lived out in, in the married life. So it, it's going yeah. to be something that we live out in our families. We, we ask God for a gift to love our families, love our enemies, and love the, the people where we're giving of ourselves with great wisdom. Father, we have just about a, another minute or so. Do you want to give anything to conclude with? Well, it's important that there is a hierarchy in love. First of all, we love God. Then we love ourselves. We are concerned that we will be saints. Then we love other people. We love their spiritual dimension, their perspective of sanctity. Huh? Mm -hmm. And then we love our bodies. Huh? Uh, and so the military chaplain may uh, be in a difficult situation, but he's concerned to help people to get to heaven. And so he may be in a dangerous situation because there is this hierarchy. Mm -hmm. And obviously, as we love God, we love those who are close more than those who are distant. Right. But we don't exclude those who are in distant continents. We right. also want them to be saints. So. Yes. Well, this is uh, we're with Father Wojciech yeah. Giertig. Father, thank you very much for being with us. Your book, The Mystery of Divine Love, is yes. available for people to use in their prayer. Bring this to your holy hour. You can get this at EWTNRC.com, where it's item number 82750. And join me, if you would, Father, in giving a blessing. May Almighty God bless you all and keep you, the Father, the Son, mm -hmm. And the Holy Spirit. The Son. Ah, Amen. And the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we can bring you Father Gerte from Rome and all the other programs we bring you, whether from any of our studios, because your support keeps us going by keeping us in between your gas bill, electric bill, and cable bill. Thank you for your support, and God bless you all. <laughs>